You're listening to the PJF Podcast, a show dedicated to decoding elite sports performance and fitness. I'm Paul Fabritz, and I'm an NBA strength and conditioning and performance trainer. If you want to become superhuman, take your fitness, and take your sports performance to the next level, this is the podcast for you. Let's do it. What's up, my squids? The podcast is back. This is the Sean Kemp episode. No, Sean Kemp is not on the podcast, but this is episode 40. Took a big break and I don't I don't even know how it's it's probably been a year. Uh, Maybe not quite a year. It's been close to a year since the podcast has been up and running. I've been super busy with a lot of stuff, um, new programs and launching new uh, ventures, new companies. So I haven't had time to do the podcast, but now I got some time to hop back on and I'm going to try my best to get you guys at least one a week. No guarantees on that, uh, but we're going to try because I know that we have a pretty loyal following who who love the podcast. The views aren't as high as the social media posts, and it takes 30,000 times the effort to sit here for hours doing the podcast, but there's some people who just love it, and so for those people, we got to pump it out. I got some new ideas for the podcast. I'm going to have some different segments of the show. I'm going to have like partial guests. Today, you're going to see phone a friend segment. If I need somebody to weigh in on a topic, I'm going to phone a friend, an expert in that field, and have them weigh in. Uh, So they may not be the guest for the entire time, but they're going to be a guest for a small segment. I'm going to do squid reacts at the end where I react to some YouTube videos or react to a study or, uh, you know, different topics. We're going to have Q and A's. We're still going to have our main topics, but I want to kind of have these different segments to the show. Um, other than that, updates on what's been going on with me. We got some big news. I think some of you guys have probably seen on social media, we're having a baby and we got the gender and I wanted to wait for the podcast to do the official gender reveal. It's a boy. It is a boy. My first shot got it that now all I said, I I actually thought it was going to be a girl. And I told Ashley, all I care about is one thing, healthy. I don't care the gender, just healthy. Uh, But, you know, it it ended up being male. And so the reason why I was so excited about that is because the legacy lives on. I was the last boy of my family. I have two older sisters. Uh, But the favorite's name was very close to being extinct. And so now uh, the name lives on. Um, And so we also have a name. We also have a name. The name is Jackson Lee Favorites. Jackson with an X. All right, we got to throw a little twist in there. Now, don't ask me who I named him after. It was completely random. We were in Santa Barbara and it had been several weeks and we were just bouncing ideas back and forth and we didn't like any of the names that we were coming up with. I'm like, you know what? Let's Google this and let's search ESPN top 100 best basketball players in the senior or junior class. And there was just some good names, some unique names. And I saw Jackson, and that kind of hit a little different. Now it was Jackson with an X and an S. And I was like, oh, that's a little too much. Let's drop the S, and let's just have it Jackson, J-A-X-O-N. Um, and then Ashley loved it, and she's like, okay, now we need a middle name. And I just blurted out Lee, just because it sounded good. And so we went with that. I think it's a strong name. It's a name that uh, later on in life in business, it it could be a good, strong business name. It could be a a strong athlete's name, Jackson Lee favorites. Uh, It's a good baby name, Baby Jacks. It's a cute baby name. Um, So it it, uh, hit all the the different categories that we were looking for in a name. Um, So yeah, uh, due date is May 5th, Cinco de Mayo. Um, so looking forward to that, kind of preparing for that, transitioning, starting to read the books and do all that stuff. It's going to be a big transition for me because my mind is always, you know, in in training land and and I spend all this time, you know, we're, we're talking 12 hours a day on the craft and then still finding time for family. And um, but even in that time, like, you know, Ashley's mind sometimes is somewhere else thinking about the business stuff. My mind is elsewhere thinking about the business stuff. So we have to get like. I have to change my life and I have to figure out how to constantly be present, 
right? And so I, I gotta I gotta have a little bit more structure. Whereas up until now, my uh, a lot of my best ideas have been from me just like constantly being able to think at all times, like going to bed and thinking of ideas. I dream of ideas. I wake up and sometimes my first thought is training related stuff. So I, it's going to be a huge transition for me, but you know, um, I, I'm pretty good at adjusting. I'm pretty good at, uh, getting thrown into the fire and figuring it out. So, um, I, I think I'm as ready, uh, as I can be, but I know that it's going to, you know, it, everybody who's having their first kid tells me over and over again, like you think you're ready, uh, but you're not, it's going to hit you in the face and you're just going to have to adapt. Um, so I'm looking forward to the new challenge. I think my calling is to be a dad. I've always just wanted to be a dad, um, want to be the best dad I can be. And so now my whole priority, my mentality, everything is shifting. Um, so I'm excited for that. I think it's going to give uh, my life a little bit more depth and perspective and I think that uh, it's, it, I need that. It's going to be really good for me. Other updates since we last talked to the squids, we got new programs. Um, so I think we had just launched Speed Code probably the last time we talked. Now we have Durability Code, and we also have the Mac McClung Jump Program. Um, so, and, and I'm going to spend a lot of time on the podcast talking through these programs, not today, um, but in some future episodes, we'll dive a little bit deeper. Um, but durability code, the results have been amazing. Um, the idea is injury reduction, but it's a full, full body training program. It's strength and conditioning. There's, you know, full body strength training. There's such a carefully progressed plyometric program. It's the best we've ever done at being able to regress and progress to fit numerous levels, to get people back into impact based exercise. So whether you're using it as like late stage rehab, or you're just somebody who like, Hey, I go do plyometrics and I always get these nagging pains. This is going to start you at the lowest level and it carefully progresses you. Um, but there's conditioning, right? There's lifestyle stuff, how to sit, how to eat, um, a sleep guide. There's, it's just so comprehensive. Like injuries are, uh, multifactorial. People want to say that it's one thing. It's not, there's hundreds of things. And I think that with this program, my goal was to attack everything from strength to proprioception to movement quality. Um, basically everything is taken care of. There's an eight week program, um, restore. And then the more advanced one is prime. And ideally you want to go through restore into prime. And then once you finish prime, so that's 16 weeks total, you're going to be pretty much ready to hop into any other program. Um, and your body's going to be fully prepared to handle that. But, you know, we have kids on it. We have adults 40 years old on it, but we have professional athletes on it because there's so many different levels to the exercises. Um, we got NBA players, MLS, and, and the feedback has been crazy with just how good their body feels getting rid of nagging pain, but still getting stronger and more athletic at the same time. Um, and then the Mac McClung program, this one kind of came out of left field. This is one that I didn't have planned. I had the durability code, uh, planned. Um, but the, the Mac McClung, he came to me with this idea and obviously I'm a, a huge Mac McClung fan. He's one of the best athletes in all of pro basketball right now. Um, broke the, the, uh, three quarters court sprint test. I think he had like, it was like two, nine, four or something. So we're talking like fastest since 2001, you know, I got a 44, 45 inch vertical max approach. We're talking 48, one of the best on paper, um, as far as testing, one of the best athletes in the game today, but then he also puts it together on the court. He's got agility, whatever. I'm trying to tell you the, the point of me saying that is I've been a fan and I've been studying his athleticism. Um, and so we linked up and we started chatting, um, and he, uh, brought this idea to me. He's like, Hey, you know, I made a huge transformation early on in high school, right? When he started going viral with all these through the leg in game dunks, people are like, well, this guy just like popped up out of nowhere. But, you know, since like seventh, eighth grade, he was working in his garage with his dad. And so there's genetic influences. Like I think his, his sister was like a good soccer player and like, it's a family of athletes, right? Like no one is saying that you're going to do this program and all of a sudden become Mac McClung. There's obviously genetic components for all great athletes. There's the genetics, but then there's environment, there's training. And he's like, look, I, I still have everything. Uh, his dad, um, took him through these workouts. 
still had everything on paper um, in a PDF. And so he sent it over to me and he's like, this is what I did. It worked really well for me. I want to help other people make a big transformation in their athleticism. But I know that you're the guy who can actually make this into a program that makes sense instead of just like, hey, here's these exercises. Um, and he's smart. Most most people are like, well, I jump high, so then I'll just give you exactly what I did. But most people don't realize, hey, you know, I'm not a coach. I'm not a trainer. I don't have years of experience doing this. Um, and so he's self-aware enough to be like, Hey, this worked, but I want you to be the one who puts it all together, um, and makes it a well-rounded program. Uh, so he brought it to me and first of all, the stuff made sense. I can step back and analyze it from a scientific standpoint, just from like a physics standpoint. Um, the extra, most of the exercises just made sense. And it's stuff that I preach. It's like it's similar principles to stuff that people did, like in the vert code, but it's different exercises. Um, you know, it, every principle could be satisfied by a hundred different exercises, and so all the exercises that he did were different. Most of them were different than what we did in the vert code, um, but very similar principles. And so, from a logical standpoint, they made sense. From an evidence-based standpoint, they made sense. So then for me, I wanted to look at this from a scientific lens and say, what can we eliminate? What can we add in? And then it's like, okay, you did this, but I've worked with thousands of athletes. And I know that not everybody can go straight to this exercise. So then it's like, how do I build the regressions and progressions so that somebody who isn't at your level, even your freshman year, you're probably further along than a lot of these other kids who are going to do the program. So it's like, hey, how do I get them in at a really low level and then give them ways to progress to this level and beyond? And so every exercise that he gave me, I built these regressions and progressions. And then I also added in uh, my own touch, right? So we did everything that he did, but then I also added in injury reduction exercises. So you'll see like the first couple phases, we have two two week phases. Um, so like your first month is mostly my stuff uh, that is just giving you connective tissue resilience. It's like getting you into the program, prehab type of stuff. And then we get into more of like, the things that, that Mac built. But then uh, also, um, there's still my favorite vertical jump exercises in there as well. So it's like a good combination of the stuff that he did, the stuff that I found works really well, um, plus injury reduction stuff, and, and made it into this entire 16-week program. Um, so that's how the, the Mac McClung program came about. Um, the, the number one question that I get is like, well, what's the difference between that and vert code? And the main difference is just different exercises. So it provides a different stimulus. And so vert code is, I probably released it, I don't even know, maybe five years ago. So there's a lot of people who went through like vert code elites an entire year. You went through that and that was four years ago. And I do advise that people go back and touch up on that and you can even do the whole program again and people normally still get results. But for some people, it's like, okay, I did it and then I did it again and then I did it again. At some point, your body needs a new stimulus. And so for those people, like the Mac McClung program makes a lot of sense. So it's not that you have to do vert code first or Mac program first. I think the ideal scenario would be realizing, hey, training is for life. I'm gonna do a lot of programs throughout my career. Um, and so doing vert code and doing the Mac at some point or doing the Mac and then doing the vert code. I, I think at some point you should probably do both programs. Um, so that's a quick update. And again, we're gonna talk more in depth about these programs, but that is an update. Um, uh, Upper Echelon is doing great. Uh, we're starting to really grow. We're starting to uh, get the protein in certain grocery stores. You won't see them in a popular grocery store yet. That's gonna be another couple of years, but we're starting to get them into uh, a few grocery stores. And we have the sleep support supplement now. Um, we're coming out with the pre-workout. Uh, the collagen is killing it. Everybody loves the collagen and people are getting good results with that for joint health, for tendon health. Um, and then the protein, we still have the chocolate and vanilla um, and, and people are loving it. The reviews are crazy on, on uh, the upper echelon products because it is quite literally upper echelon. It's the, the top ingredients that we can get our hands on. Um, so we are not cutting corners for to, to make an extra profit. And the last quick update is we do have 
our own physical products now. Uh, the main one that we have is bands. And so we have these extra length bands on Amazon that are so good. And we'll talk about them more in depth, but it's over six feet and it's a fabric band. So it's really durable. They don't uh, rip as easily as a normal band, but the longer the band, the more we can adjust it. Think about like vertical jumps. If I'm going to loop two bands around, if it's a short band, then I have one tension to work with. But if it's a long band, I could have a little bit of tension or I could wrap it around uh, my anchor twice and have more or three times. These ones you could literally wrap like five times. And so you're getting your, the resistance is very, very scalable where I could get a crazy high resistance or a really low resistance. Um, and it's comfortable because it's fabric. It doesn't like dig into your skin like a lot of the normal bands. So I got tired of like linking all these bands together. If you're a strength coach, you know what I'm talking about. You got to tie these bands together to get any decent length. And then you got to untie them. And that takes so long. It's like probably one of the number one stressors of my life was tying and untying these bands constantly session after session. And so I'm like, let's make a really long band so that you never have to do this again. And so you, you have the length, um, which is great for like resisted sprints and that kind of stuff, assisted jumps. Um, so try them out. Those are on Amazon. You could just search PJF extended length bands. Um, and I think you'll love them. And then we have the normal size and we have the mini band um, on our website currently. And we have new med balls. Uh, so check those out. Um, so those are the updates. We're pretty much all caught up. Now I want to get into the first topic of the day. I've been doing this series on Instagram where I'm breaking down the top 15 most athletic hoopers. And the reason I did it is one, it's fun and I like to have fun Two, uh, I think it's actually a good educational experience for some of our listeners, because when you hear athleticism, 99% of people are just going to rank the top dunkers and people are so blinded by like dunking that they think that that is the goal. That's part of our goal. Jumping high is part of our goal, but I want people to open up their eyes to like the best athletes have these different qualities right? Instead of just like, oh, we're all, you know, the best dunkers. Um, so I started breaking those down uh, and I wanted to save the top five for the podcast. And so I'm going to take you through my top five and then I'm going to phone a friend who I trust in this area. I'm going to phone, I'm going to call Max Schmarzo because he has a good eye. He has kind of the eye that I have of like, let's look at, uh, ground contact time. Let's look at, do you have a pop to your step? Let's look at quickness versus explosiveness versus speed and breaking down like the, the details of athleticism. So I'm going to ask him his top five, but first I'm going to give you my top five most athletic pro hoopers today. Drum roll. Coming in at number five, we got Anthony Edwards. My man is around, got to be 230. Listed at 6'4", might even be 6'5", and I'm not taking into account length and height for this. It's pure athleticism. But the way my guy moves at that size is insane. You see the poster dunks. The vert has got to be low to mid 40s. At 230 to have that bounce is impressive already, but it's the agility. It's the quickness he has at that size. It's the fluidity. It's the body control. Um the dude is just an overall athlete. If you wanted to move him higher, I'd be fine with that. Um, but he's got to be in my top five. Coming in at number four, and this just shows how athletic the league is, to have this guy at number four who, man, you can make the argument that he's one of the most athletic ever. Zach Levine. Coming in at number four, he he could be higher, but the top three are just so athletic that I I couldn't put him above those guys. But uh, Zach has, you know, combine, we're talking 41 inch vertical, but with workouts where there's not a 15 foot limit where you give him momentum, he's a 46. So he goes up five inches when you give him momentum because he's a gazelle. Uh, he, he's not just pure power. He's that gazelle where he's going to, um, he's going to benefit off a little bit more momentum coming into his jump, jumps pretty well off two feet, but jumps insanely well off one foot. But it's not just that because there's a lot of guys who can jump in that 41 to 46 range. It's his quickness. He's got such a good combination of speed, 
where we're talking end to end, get up and down, you'll see him just get out and transition like a wide receiver and the dude can really, really run. But it's not just the speed, it's the explosiveness. L look at the first step explosiveness. Uh, the, the, when we talk about acceleration for basketball players, we're looking at step one, step two, step three. I don't care your end-to-end -end speed. If you have those three steps, now you have leverage. Now I can put somebody in jail, right? I can use my body to get in front of them. So there's some guys that don't have great speed, but those first three steps are so explosive that they can make a career off of that alone. Um, so he has the speed, he has the explosion, and then he has the twitch. He has the raw quickness. Watch him do like a trigger step. My buddy Drew Hanlon will, will, will teach this a lot. And he'll do these trigger steps where he like kind of laterally floats out, peeks up at the rim, and then that, that right foot will like go back a little bit, um, kind of into a negative step. And that is like a fun test. I can see somebody do something like a trigger step, and I can see how much twitch you have, how much raw quickness you have. And he's just so quick with that. Quickness isn't always about force production. Quickness is like who can move their hand faster here. Not just reaction, but like when I want to move my hand here, how fast can I move? When I want to get my foot in this position, how fast can I get it there? It's not how much force can I produce. It's how quick can I get it there? Now that I'm in position, now that's where force comes into play. And that's where acceleration, right? Now it's explosiveness. Now it's more trainable through plyometrics and weight room stuff, right? Where it's like, how much force can I apply in the ground at the right direction? So that's where like, he has the raw quickness to always get there first. And then when it's time to produce force, he can also put a lot of force in the ground and cover distance. So when you have that three headed monster of the Twitch, AKA raw quickness, and then you have the explosiveness, the pure acceleration, um, the deceleration to go with that and the end to end speed. That's when you're next level to me. And Zach's got that. Um, next up number three and shoot, he could be number one. If you say I'm crazy for putting him at number three and not one, I'm fine with that. Your boy, Jalen Green. Jalen Green is, I, I did a video breakdown on YouTube about how he's so similar to MJ. He's the closest thing to MJ that we've ever seen athletically. I'm not saying he's MJ. I'm saying from an athleticism standpoint, he's the same height. He's the same length, um, very similar vertical um, but they jump well out of any scenario. They jump off one, they jump off two, the fluidity of movement, the way that they move, they both internally rotate really well. You'll see him jump with so much internal rotation, knees diving in, but that's not valgus. It's just hip internal rotation. Uh, so the biomechanists would freak out when they see him jump, but they shouldn't. Um, and he, he's very, very similar to Michael Jordan, but he's got this quickness. He's got this pop to his step. He doesn't sink into his joints when he goes to make a step. He's got that pop, right? That RSI, reactive strength index. Um, the quickness, the explosiveness, the pop to his step, the vertical, the ability to do it off one and off two. He is one of the most athletic in the game and one of the most athletic I've seen on a basketball court. Uh, coming in at number two is the most athletic human of all time on a basketball court, in my opinion. The reason he's not at number one is just because he hasn't played this year due to injury, and his name is Zion Williamson. I think he's the most athletic player ever to step on a basketball court. I really do. And, and the reason is at that size, and you know, nor, let's say his rookie year, I think he's still playing at like, even though he's pretty lean, I think he's 285, something like that. Um, so to be that big and to move like that, the amount of force production is insane. I would say that he's the best absolute force producer, right? Relative force production is force production relative to your body weight. So small guys are typically going to be better there. But Zion's absolute force production of just the pure amount of force you put in the floor, it's got to be the best of all time. The only guy that I can think of that might compete would be Shaq, like prime Shaq, Orlando or early uh, LA Shaq. His force production was insane um, because his body weight was so high and then he was still jumping high, running fast. Um, LeBron's up there too, for sure. Uh, but Zion is bigger than LeBron and jumps a little bit higher than LeBron. Um, 
and also jumps way better than LeBron off two feet. They have similar bounce off one. I would take Zion's by a little bit, probably a couple inches higher, but but Zion's two foot jump is significantly better than LeBron. The other thing that Zion has though, and this is not just about dunking. This is what I want you guys to understand. Zion has insane agility. I'm trying to tell you, man, when he gets in the lane, his change of direction and agility is so sharp. He'll have these little like spin moves. His body awareness, his body control is crazy. He has these coordinated layups where he'll jump high and like come out like point guard stuff. And, and people, uh, it, it gets overlooked just because people are looking for his highlight dunks. But the way that this dude moves from an agility standpoint is wild. To be three, uh, to, to be 285 moving like that is crazy. And then his second jump, Right, you'll see like uh, he'll go up and tip it and come down and just spring off. Like his RSI is so high. RSI is like a gazelle thing, not a tiger thing. And he's a tiger with gazelle type of spring. And so that's what's so rare. You you don't see guys, re, you don't see heavy guys being really really good with that spring, that RSI. They might still jump high, but it's because they have so much muscular power. But he's that beautiful combo of the tiger, the power and the gazelle, the spring. And so if he was healthy, if he was playing right now, he would probably be my number one. But because he's out, that brings me to the most athletic basketball player in the entire world, John Morant. It's gotta be. The dude's got an insane vert. He's got crazy speed. He's got great agility. He's got the body awareness. Uh, he's got the quickness. He ticks off every single box when it comes to athleticism. Um, you got a guy who's, I don't know what he's listed. He's probably listed at like 6'2", but I think in real life he's like 6'1", and he's thin. Like this is a small guy. Like this is Allen Iverson. This is basically Allen I People appreciated how small Allen Iverson was and how much he did and how he drove the lane and dominated with quickness and athleticism and got knocked around. Like people don't give John Morant that credit just because he jumps so high and dunks over people. People assume that he's like a pretty big guy. He's basically Allen Iverson and he's going through the lane and postering bigs. Like he's dominating off his athleticism at 6'1", which is very, very rare. And he's so... He, his movement fluidity is really good. His uh, elasticity is insane. He doesn't have as much pure twitch as like a De'Aaron Fox. He has some good twitch, but a, like a De'Aaron Fox has more pure twitch, pure quickness. But Jal, you'll see like there are situations where he'll just back it out. Like he'll just come back and then he'll run down, he'll hit you and do that little cross jab um, because his like his speed is so good. And then his his vert is just insane. He's so elastic. He's so fluid. If you've seen like the the videos of him dunking in warm ups, where like the arms are like way up above his head, all the stuff that we talk about with jump mechanics, his fluidity is just so insane. So he is number one. Now I'm gonna call Max, and I'm gonna see who his top five are. And if he doesn't have the same top five as me exact top five, then he's not my friend anymore. All right, let's get him on the phone. So we're phoning a friend. We got Max on the phone to get his top five. And like I said, hey, hey, if your top five is not the same as my top five, we're not friends anymore. So a lot of pressure on the line. I got I, I got a different top five. I can guarantee it. Um, I guess a lot has to do with how you judge athleticism, right? Right. And so I think people... The, the common person would be like, hey, if they jump high or they run fast, that's athletic. I'm like, well, kind of, right? And this so is why and, th and this is why I called you because you have an <laughs> eye for the other aspects of athleticism that matter just as much, if not more. I'll go through five people in no particular order and I'll justify them. So you don't go all wild at me that, you know, maybe Yokish makes an appearance. Oh, on no, there. no, 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 no. We can't have that. Don't go all wild, but we'll, we'll go go through it. So number one, LeBron. No, no, no. Okay, 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 okay. Can LeBron? I go through it or no? LeBron? LeBron. So justify LeBron first. Yeah, yeah, I will. Okay. His age on any sort of research data implies that he should not be doing what he's doing. So relative to his peers of that age cohort, he is exponentially more athletic than anyone else relative to their peers. Yep. It's it's 
bar none on that one. Like if you had to put a some sort of coefficient where you measure their ability relative to their peers, I think LeBron has to be number one. Yeah. So you're factoring in durability, age. Yeah. So I didn't factor that in, but I agree. If that's part of your qualifications, agreed. And I think you could say he's the number one of all time because of what he's, not just right now, but number one of all time because of how long he's done it. If we're factoring in that durability. Yeah. And, and, and what is he, 36, 37? Yeah. More? But, but also no Evan. college basketball. So you're talking straight out the league and he was doing bringing teams to the playoffs early in his career. So you add in the playoff games, it's just unreal. Yeah, I, I think he's unbelievable. So we'll, we'll put that there and he's in a separate category. And you can even argue young LeBron might have been the best athletes to ever grace a court, mm -hmm. period. Mm -hmm. So he has lots going for him. Number two, this is kind of a questionable one because I don't know if he counts legally, but he did get a 10-day contract the other day. Rajon Tucker. If you don't know him, check him out. I, I don't even know who that is. Yes, you'll love it. Former Florida Gulf Coast University Hooper. Um, played for the Herd in the G League. He just got called up by the Mavericks. And he's the... It looks like someone decided to stick a linebacker who's 6'5 and have him play basketball. Hmm. He's built. He's explosive. And what he does that amazes me is his ability to dunk in a variety of fashion. So express that for us in multiple ways. You get guys like a Gerald Green who is so explosive when he has a run-up. Or, and, but, he, but he's not like off one foot off a bump dunking on someone. Yeah. You go watch Tucker at 6'5", mil Euro, one foot, two hand dunk on you. Kind of like a young Dwayne Wade mm -hmm. used to do. Right. And I th that is something really special because that requires so much force to do. Right. A lot of guys, everything get... is an entirely every dunk is an entirely different skill it's like how people look at like mma versus boxing and the normal person's like oh it's kind of the same like they're just fighting but then you see like oh it doesn't really translate the two foot standing jump doesn't translate perfectly to the approach jump but the approach jump doesn't transfer perfectly to the hop step jump and that doesn't transfer to the euro step jump like it's everything is its own category so to be able to do all of these things at a high level is just so different than going and jumping 48 inches. Exactly. It's, he's one of the few guys who I've seen at full speed get really high and then get bumped in the same thing in the paint and still dunk on you. And that's really rare because that requires the ability to have the twitchy kind of springs and also kind of that rocket ship explosiveness. Okay, so now, now I have fear of missing out. Now I am now I really need to go do some research. Uh, what's the name, Rajon? Rajon, I believe it's spelled R-A-Y-J-O-N, Tucker. Okay. Now, number three, it, it, I, okay, I'll say a year and a half ago, kind of. I can't not put Zion on this. I had Zion, like, Zion in number two. It's like really hard to because currently I haven't seen him play in a year and a half. I don't know. Yeah. In his college days, he is the single greatest pound for pound athlete because what happens is people realize they go oh that guy's little he can jump high no it's harder when you're bigger yeah. to jump high it's one foot dunk from the free throw line the other day again and it's one of the most amazing things to be 280 pounds and take off of one foot and yak that because he's not far off weight wise to, to like a young shack doing that like it's he's not that far off What's crazy is almost the exact same thing that you just said is the exact thing that I went over just 20 minutes ago. <laughs> like that's why Max is on this segment is because he gets it. You know, absolute force production. He has to be number one of all time unless in a young Shaq has some to say about that where he's 300 something and jumping well as well. But from an absolute force production standpoint, he's got to be one or two. It, it, it's I think P3 came out and said he was the best ever recorded on a depth jump they've had. Yeah, for sure. That doesn't make any sense. Like that physiologically, your bones have to be so strong to handle those forces, your tendons, your whatever you want to call it, has to be so prepared to do that. Right. It's um, so that's three. Number four, I think it'd be a disservice to not put John Murat on here. So he's my um, number one. And I think Ja is super athletic, but I do give him the downside of he doesn't have that power dunking ability, right? He might be the most like, okay, he'll go one, two on you. He needs, he likes momentum. I've never seen him take a bump and then go off one and just 
you know, dunk on something. Well, he's like, than- he's like 180. So I don't know. I, I, I think if he takes a bump that high up in the air, it's so hard to go through somebody and finish. When you watch Rajon Tucker, when you watch after this, you watch his YouTube clips, you'll get what I'm saying. Because it's like a Russell Westbrook met an NFL player. <laughs> it doesn't make right. any sense to me when I watch it. It's how I wish my athleticism was. So when I see Ja, I see the guy who I played against. So when I grew up, I played with Devontae Adams. And he might have been closer to the most athletic person I've ever seen. In high school, he could kiss the rim. But he'd also put a shoulder on you and dunk on you. And there's another guy in my team who people don't know about. His name is uh, Maurice. He actually didn't play, so whatever, blah, blah, blah. Super athletic guy, but he was like Ja. Where if he had space, he would take off on you. But he would never, like, bump you and then dunk on you. Mm-hmm. And so I, I think there's a difference there. I've always envied on my side the ability to bump and dunk because that just tells you something about their entire ability to proprioceptively handle a contact yeah. and then align themselves in about a 0.2 second window to then get off the ground. I just don't get that because sometimes I get bumped and I have trouble making a layout. <laughs> so that helps in dunking on someone and yeah. getting bumped. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'm a little bit more biased as a point guard to look at quickness, explosiveness, and and speed as like my top things and then jumping. Um, so that's a difference in like w- the way that we look at things. That's why I have to have jaw so high is because he jumps 45 something inches, whatever, but his pure speed and his quickness and his change of direction is next level. So that's your number four. Uh, now the last, yeah. the last one, not traditional one. Okay, so it's not like Mr. Explosive because you could think about who is the kid for the Knicks who puts his chin above the rim. He's a super athlete, uh, that center. Um, but I, I decided to go a different route. I went Steph Curry. And here's mm. why. Wow. I, I cannot get over his dexterity. So you talk about athleticism as a whole. And you want to embody all things athletic. When I think of athleticism, I also think about if I were to play a baseball game, who would I pick? If I were to go golfing, who would I pick? If I had to go play football, any sport, who's going to pick it up the quickest? I think he'd be one of the quickest learners when it comes to movement. So he might not be the guy who's A plus speed, A plus explosiveness, but I have trouble finding someone else who I'd bet that could pick up a sport as quick as him yeah. in the league. And that's a thing of athleticism that isn't talked about, right? You could talk about his ability to shoot off the move and his ability to have a tight handle. That's all great and all. But the most amazing thing is a stupid, like, messing around one hand floaters he'll throw up that go in the hoop and at times that is that is a lot harder to do than any of his three-point shots he's taken like it is unbelievable how difficult it is to be consistent in that so the hand-eye coordination and con- conjunction with his ability to perceive depth and his own force outputs mm-hmm. if he had some sort if you had a scale that you can measure someone's ability to know how much force they're producing and you had a variability of it, he'd be so spot on with his ability to reproduce certain levels of force. Yeah. When I see explosive guys, sometimes they are all or none. Mm-hmm. He has the ability to toggle back and forth. That is unbelievable. So in a way, you might think of a dragster, a drag car that goes really fast as something that's a fast car. He might be more like um, something that can accelerate quickly and maneuver and handle in a way. So it's like, oh, it's one faster well in the straightaway the guy who's more explosive faster but if i'm weaving in and out of traffic maybe this other one's actually faster because it's gonna make less mistakes right yeah i like what you did there with that i think um he's in a different category for me of type two athleticism i kind of base this list off type one and that's like your traditional measures of pure explosiveness and speed and quickness type two is like proprioception it's body control it's awareness it's all of these other things like yeah who picks up a sport the fastest it's like this other side of athleticism that you know people take for granted and and the reason is it's not as measurable like it's hard to measure steph curry's proprioception on the court whereas it's easy to measure somebody's force output and so it's it, these are qualities that it's like you have to have the eye to be able to see it to really appreciate that so it's kind of like this this different type of athleticism. I should do a whole list on type two athleticism because um, those some of the best players in the world have just the highest type two from him to Harden to, like you said, Jokic to uh, Kyrie Irving has a ton of type two athleticism. Um, and, and in that category is those things and like, you know, your control in the air. 
Like how do you control your limbs? That's kind of an entirely separate thing. And it's a blurred line between uh, type two athleticism and skill. It's like, where is that tipping point? Because you could say, well, Steph Curry is just really skilled. But I look at like, what is athleticism? Kind of like what you said, would it, would that trait help you in a different sport? And that body control and the proprioception, that would actually help him on the football field. Change of speeds is a type two athleticism trait. Would that help you as a wide receiver? Yes. So his ability to shoot a basketball, that's a skill. That's not so as much athleticism. That would not help you on the football field. But all those other underlying traits, those would help him in other sports. So that I put that under type two athleticism. So is MJ the greatest athlete then? Because he golf baseball, basketball, skilled aspects of basketball, a shooter, yeah. finish abilities, plus off the charts vertical. Now he doesn't have the mass yeah. that some of these other. I, I'd, um, I'd be fine putting him as the best athlete, overall athlete, yeah. I, I think that speaks volumes. You look at someone like Bo Jackson, not in basketball, right. but a guy who plays sports with that. He might be the best athlete ever in history. You yeah. just watch his baseball highlights. And in baseball, a sport that doesn't allow for displays of athleticism, you'll see things that make no sense. Mm -hmm. Like there's a play where he caught a fly ball and he ran up the outfield wall for like four steps. Yeah, I remember that. They're like, like or even the mo like a thing that doesn't make any sense is taking a bat. Now a lot of guys will break it over their knee. He puts it on his helmet and breaks it over his head. A baseball bat. Yeah. But like, anyone's ever taken a baseball bat and realized how hard it is to break, then break it over your knee, but then put it over your head and snap it is like one of those things that just you watch and it, I can't do that no matter how hard I try. Right. Something placed there that I don't understand. <laughs> yeah. No, I love it. Uh, that I love that. Love your top five. Very different from mine. You went in a whole different direction. Love that. That's why we had to have you on for this segment. I knew you would not have the same top five as me and I knew you'd have an entirely different spin off of it. Uh, but, but I love it. Um, we'll, we'll have you back on, um, the, uh, phone a friend quite often because we go back and forth on text like every morning. So I'm basically phoning sure. you in a way every morning already. <laughs> now we're just going to do it on video. Uh, make use of, I appreciate you, Paul. Have a good one, man. Yes, sir. All right, my man. All right, guys, now we're going to get into the main topic for the day. Now, the reason why I wanted to do top three exercises for the approach jump is because I think in episode one, I did my top three for vertical jump. Um, but I base that more so on standing jump. And like I just said, like what I just talked about with Max is like, it's MMA versus boxing. Right? It all looks the same, but it's so entirely different. The physical qualities needed, the skill, the nervous system, it's so different for an approach jump than for a stationary jump. Um, and so my exercises will change based on the goal. And even like, I, I don't know which exercise I said for the first podcast, but I think there's ones that I would remove. Like I think, I think I had a high pull in there because I wanted something that was high power that wasn't a plyometric contact. So I said like, look, I'm stuck on an island with these three exercises. And so I needed one that fills a gap where I had my strength exercise. I think I had a rear foot elevated. And then I had my plyo, which I think I put in a depth jump, correct me if I'm wrong. And then I needed that middle ground where it's not a plyometric, but we're getting high power output. And so I wanted an Olympic lifting variation, but because of the learning curve, I said uh, a high pull because it's simple to get max intent um, and it's less of a skilled exercise. I would definitely remove that for approach jumping. And I also don't really think it's that necessary for a standing vertical jump. I think it's a good option, but I definitely don't think that that's necessary. Um, but for a standing jump, the reason why that would uh, translate a little bit better is because a standing jump is pretty hingy, right? I get a big hip hinge and yes, I get to, I bend my knees as well, but it looks like the bottom of like a trap bar deadlift, or it looks like the bottom of a, um, you know, a hang pole where I'm coming down to right above my knees and then I'm pulling up. That's a kind of a hip dominant exercise. Um, and that second pole, you get pretty high uh, power output, but 
it just doesn't translate over to approach jump very well, in my opinion, um, because there's just such a little hinge. There's not much of a hip hinge in approach jumping. In fact, the best approach jumpers, as long as I have some speed, I'm keeping my shoulders up above the hips, right? Rib cage over pelvis. Um, and if I have a big hip hinge, I'm losing all that momentum coming up. So you're going to see more of that hingy type of jump from a standing jump, from a one step, even from a two step. Like if you have really low approach distance, low approach speed, then those hingy exercises tend to translate a little bit better. Then you look at a approach jump, right there. The torso is going to be almost completely upright. There's going to be rotation, but I'm going to stay shoulders above pelvis. I'm not going to bring it out in front uh, like I would at the bottom of a stationary jump. So um, I'm stuck on this island, and I only get these three exercises to jump higher, to dunk better. Coming in at number one, low rim dunks. Give me a rim and give me a ball, and that's all I really need. That's what I want. So it doesn't have to be low rim. If you have the ability to dunk on 10, great, work with that. Um, but if you are, you know, you can't quite dunk on 10 or you're getting in pretty weak dunks on 10, get that rim a little bit lower. Let's have some freestyle dunk sessions. Set the clock for 15, 20 minutes. You know, do it. It depends on what phase is hard to give sets and reps, but do it for two days a week, sometimes up to three days a week, even in, in certain cases, and just get out there and dunk. Now, I... At one point, I would think of a dunk session as this is how we get our athleticism to translate to dunking, right? It's more so you're working on the skill of dunking. I've said this a million times. Dunking is not just athleticism. It is a skill. So you got to work on that skill. But now I also look at it as a way to improve pure jump height. I think it's one of the best ways. Once I started studying the brain and brain chemistry, I started to realize that the most exciting form of training is the best for your vertical jump. The things that get you hyped, the things that you enjoy doing, the things that give you a goal every single rep so that our body gets to get that feedback every time and self-organize. That's how you improve jump mechanics. That's the best way to improve jump mechanics. It's not always thinking your way through it or thinking like, well, I got to do this better. I got to get a better block step, higher arms. There's a time for corrections here and there with jump mechanics, but your body can basically self-organize and correct its own jump mechanics. But that's not going to happen when I'm just jumping with no goal, right? I need to have that goal. If I'm measuring a depth jump, I get that feedback. Oh, that was 28. And then I do it again. Oh, that was 29. And your body goes, that was good. I went up, replicate what I just did. And so you'll start to change your jump mechanics and you'll start to naturally improve that skill. And with dunking, you're always getting that goal. So if you throw down a hard dunk, your body organizes and goes, oh, that's the way that we should jump. And then you get rim stuffed and it's like, okay, don't do what I just did. And this isn't a conscious process, but it's happening at the subconscious level. Um, so from the standpoint of having a goal so that we can self-organize, dunking is one of the best things that we can do. And then from a brain chemistry standpoint, we talk about, okay, I got to get the nervous system to operate at 100% or 101, 102, 103% in order to make this neural adaptation. Well, if I'm in this stale, boring training, just doing basic jumps or a box jump to a low box, we're not going to get that, you know, the dopamine at, at a level where we need it to be. We're not going to get the adrenaline at a level that we need it to be to actually go to that 100, 102, 103%. Um, but dunking tends to get people there. And so when that brain chemistry is optimized, gains are going to stick better. We're going to reach higher levels of force output. We're going to reach true max intent. At the end of the day, you know, we talk about max intent on exercises. And it's key, but max intent comes from motivation. So it's motivation. How motivated am I to get this task done? And if that motivation is the highest it can possibly be, my intent is going to be really high. And if intent is really high, that's more uh, neurological drive. That's more motor units activated, right? And so that all starts like these physical adaptations, the software and the hardware, these adaptations that we're trying to make, 
at the end of the day come down to motivation and it's hard to motivate yourself to do a low box jump and actually get max intent but if you're going and dunking you're trying not to get rim stuff you're trying to throw down a new dunk and so motivation levels are increased and then the other thing with brain chemistry is like the balance between um the dopamine because at the end of the day we got to get addicted to the task i got to be excited to go back and do it um and, and dunking can get people addicted to it because we're always trying to hit a new dunk um and so it doesn't have to be dunking right it could be a depth jump but you need to do this with feedback you need to be reaching for something it could be hurdles but you got to be challenging yourself like on that hurdle height you know what i mean and obviously do that in a safe way with a collapsible hurdle but you got to have that end goal and it's got to be something where you're sitting there like dreaming about it like before a session after a session you're so excited to go do it um and, and that's something where you that's why i say you got to do what you like to do the most and for hoopers a lot of times that is that dunk session that's so much fun for them and they can actually become addicted to that um so they're gonna so from a compliance standpoint of like you're gonna keep doing this year round um i think that's where it's at instead of like boring stale training of just repetitive jump training with no goal that can be good at times right but if that's like the main way that you're training you're probably going to burn out pretty quick it's probably going to be four weeks for you and then you're gonna be like i'm tired of this um and then also there's studies showing that boring stale training actually increases risk of injury um so that's something that we definitely want to avoid basically go have fun with your jump training and the things that are the most fun and get you the most excited with jump training those are actually going to be the best thing for you okay so uh that is my number one is that that uh dunking or low rim dunking um and if you don't have a rim then at least hang a tennis ball from the ceiling i did this when i made my initial transformation i would hang a, a tennis ball and I actually would get excited to go like try to touch this tennis ball and I would record it. And uh, it was a fun thing for me. I didn't always have access to a hoop. So I just went and touched that tennis ball. And it was fun to like gradually raise that tennis ball up uh, and see myself inch after inch, um, you know, week after week getting a little bit higher. Um, so have a goal, even if it's not actually dunking, always have a goal that you're going to try to touch. Number two is going to be really any plyometric with a forward momentum component, but I'm going to choose uh, forward hurdle hops. So set up like three, four, five hurdles in a row, and they can start low, but gradually over time, we would want to move them up. And I'm coming in with a little bit of momentum, right? So let's say I'm doing it off two feet first. I can, st I can jog into it and then plant and jump off two. And then I'm just springing off two over, over the hurdles. And this is a little bit different than a standard depth jump because a standard depth jump doesn't have the horizontal component to it. We're changing up the force vector. We're changing up the timing of the ground contact. We're changing up uh, to a certain extent the muscles that are actually involved as soon as we add some forward momentum. And so the, also if I'm stuck on an island, I want to be able to do something that I could do bilaterally, two legs. I could do unilaterally with one leg. Obviously this is one of the highest um, stresses in plyometrics is like repeat um, over a hurdle, single leg jumps, or you could do this to a box where you jump to a box, off the box, to another box. Um, and so that's that's gotta be in there. I, I can switch it up. I can do a lot of different, I could do slow stretch shortening cycle where I sink down lower into my joints and then spring over, or I could do fast stretch shortening cycle, which will uh, translate over to single leg approach jumps better where I'm very quick off the ground. We're talking like less than 250 milliseconds or that slow stretch shortening cycle. I'm above 250 milliseconds, but I'm allowing myself to sink down and become a little bit, uh, more knee and hip dominant. Um, and so I can just, I can tweak it in so many different ways and train all of these qualities that I would want out of a plyometric. Okay. So, now I need a traditional strength exercise. Um, I have my, uh, my, my dunking and I have my forward hurdle. These are all like higher end of that velocity side. Now I need something that is lower velocity, but higher force. And even just from a tissue quality standpoint, this is going to be beneficial to have one of these slower movements. So I'm going to go with the same one that I had in episode one, a rear foot elevated split squat. And the reason is 
I can tweak that for different goals. So while I'm stuck on my island, I need to be able to hit a knee dominant squat, but then I could also hit a hip dominant squat. I can play with the stance really easily. I could have the foot right underneath the bar or like toe underneath the bar. And now I get that forward translated shin and now we're talking about late uh, stance we're talking about propulsive phase like ball of the foot drive but then i could get early stance mechanics like how you step into a jump where the this is where the higher breaking forces are happening and that's where the foot is out in front of the body the body's back here the foot is out here the shin is vertical or even negative right the weight is more so back on the heel and less on the ball of the foot. This is early stance mechanics. And in jumping, especially the cool one to look at is like a single leg jump. You have that early stance where you're kind of reaching that foot out in front of you and you start with that heel strike and your body, body weight is back. And this is where a lot of the magic with breaking force actually happens is early stance. I think people get away from that because they're thinking like, drive, 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 everything, ball of the foot, uh, everything with a forward shin. And that's cool, but that's late stance. That's propulsive phase. And so we want things that train that early phase of stance and then the mid stance, right? And, and a rear foot elevated can can do that because I can shift that foot back and forth and I'm, I'm biasing different muscle groups, right? I, I can get more like glutes and proximal hamstring, like high hamstring when I get that foot really far out. I'm gonna get more stresses through the knee um, when that foot is like really close and I get that shin forward. Um, so I can bias different areas. Um, and then I can also, uh, work with different like ranges. So I could do like my rhythm squats, right? If I'm on like a Smith machine, which I would advise, I like rear foot elevated more on a machine because you have some external stability. And so now I can get max intent without worrying about the balance aspect. And so I could do like these rhythms where I'm just dropping fast and springing out of it on a Smith machine, not jumping, but maybe coming to the toe and then allowing myself to drop fast and then put the brakes on at the bottom. That point of reversal has really, really high forces. So I'm getting that braking force. I'm springing out of there. So that point of reversal um, can be trained or I could go full range of motion and I can go all the way down. And so these are entirely different qualities, but we can do both of those with a rear foot elevated split squat. Whereas like uh, yeah, if I threw in an RDL um, or even a bilateral back squat, you're a little bit limited in your ability uh, to do that. Although you, you could do like your, your quarter rhythms with a barbell, but it's really hard to come to the toes because you're lacking the balance. So you would do that on like a machine or like a Smith machine. Um, so there's so many different ways that I could switch up that rear foot elevator and that satisfies my strength side. Um, and I, I definitely need one strength exercise uh, to, if, if I'm stuck on an island, I need that one strength exercise that's gonna give me high force and, and, and lower velocity. Now, those are the top three. And that being said, the top three changes based on your level, right? There's no such thing as a top three. I just give it to you guys in like a top three format because this is what you guys like. My number one question is this, like what is the best exercise? What's the top three? What's the top five? So this is me meeting you in the middle, right? The real answer is it's always dependent on context. People that put things really simply like this is what it is, they either don't fully understand the topic, so they think it's that simple, or they're just lying to you and just saying, this is what it is. Um, but it, when you really understand the context, the answer is always, it depends. It depends on your age. It depends on what program you're on, what phase, what are the exact goals, what is your training history. But you know, I wanna be able to uh, meet you guys halfway. And so these are my top three. For somebody else, that might change. But if I'm personally stuck on an island, these are the exercises that I want uh, for maximal approach jump height. All right, guys, time for a new segment. I'm calling Squid Reacts. I'm gonna react to different videos. Send in the videos that you want me to react. Let me know in the comments what you want me to react to. Um, but today, this is what we're going with. I'm only gonna watch a little bit of this video because I'm just looking for one stat that I need you guys to understand. This is the most important stat you're gonna hear all day. Most of us know we spend too much time on the couch and now there's data to back it up. About 80% of US teens and adults are not active enough, mm. according to a new report issued mm. by the federal government. Mm. But it may be easier than you think to get moving. Okay, that's all I wanted from that video. 
80% of teens and adults are not meeting the minimum requirements. And the government sets the minimum requirements of physical activity really low, and 80% don't even meet that. All right? So I'm one who talks about details and nuance about exercise. But at the end of the day, you see trainers arguing online about what's the best, and these little details, the extra 1%, get people moving. Sometimes you see these people arguing, it's pushing people further and further away from exercise. Even if I don't feel like it's the best type of exercise, you gotta understand that movement is good, okay? We need to move more. And and I hate, I'll see trainers in their, their sales pitch. They'll use like, oh man, the joint replacements are going up and all these people are getting hurt and uh, yeah, joint replacements are going to go up because physical inactivity is going up, right? Like my parents' generation, the standard was most people get enough physical activity. And now the standard is we don't even meet the minimum, right? It's going to, and it's only going to get worse. Technology is only getting better as we get into the metaverse. This is going to be one of our biggest issues is getting people to meet uh, basic physical activity guidelines. And so they go on and this wow, is this is amazing. also why I like the video Donna here. Fox is a CrossFit regular, but her workout didn't always involve heavy weights and squats. After I had kids, I realized I didn't like the way my body was. The me of 2000, let's say 12, 13, when I'm starting out, um, maybe even earlier, when I'm starting out as a trainer and I'm in LA Fitness and I'm you know, training people at parks or whatever, and then I get into that gym to share space in Tempe, I had more of the uh, elitist mindset when it comes to fitness. So CrossFits were popping up everywhere, and I was always like, that's not the best way to exercise. That's going to get you hurt because it's a kipping pull-up, and you're doing uh, cleans for time when that should never be done for time. And now I'm like, I don't care. Like, I would like to guide you towards, like, the safer ways and proper progressions and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, let's get moving, right? And so I don't, I got rid of that kind of elitist fitness mindset pretty early on. And it, because I started to realize the bigger picture, there's a lot of fear mongering. There's a lot of this language around exercise. It's the nocebo effect, which basically is, is you're getting people to be fearful of movement because we're always talking about the downsides. And it's important to understand safe movement and where it's important to understand what exercises are better uh, for, for certain goals. But at the end of the day, we got to get people moving. And so you can do this, whether you're a trainer or not. You can go get one person and encourage them to move more. You can go recruit one to five of your friends who are not physically active and get them moving. And this is going to go a long way. Next one, we are going to react to this study. So I've been diving into a lot of um, research, touching up on some stuff and learning new stuff about proprioception. I believe this is from Han and others, uh, 2015. Um, let's read this little section because I, th I think this is a good selling point for ankle proprioception. In a subsequent study, authors assessed proprioception at the knee, spine, shoulder, and hand in addition to the ankle and found proprioception at the shoulder and spine were also significantly associated with competitive level in these elite athletes that they were studying. Of these three critical body sites, ankle, shoulder, spine, ankle proprioception was correlated most strongly with sport competition level and was the most significant predictor of sports performance. These findings highlighted the importance of ankle proprioception in sporting success. Thus, although visual and vestibular functions play important roles in balance control in sports, ankle proprioception within the proprioceptive uh, within the proprioceptive system appears to be the most critical for balance control contributing to sports performance. So we talk a lot about proprioception and there's a lot that goes into it, but one of the components is the individual joints proprioception. And one of the most important is the ankle. And so think about like proprioception, like th the number one thing that we rely on, and we've known this since like the 1970s, they started doing studies in infants. Um, 
we quickly realized that we rely on vision for proprioceptive feedback. So we rely on vision, vision to kind of know where we are in space. And just the simple test of stand on one leg and have your eyes open. You could probably do it pretty easy. Now close your eyes, now it's way more difficult. So we rely on vision for a balance. But in sports, our vision is taken away from us in a sense, because our vision is tracking a player. Our vision is tracking a ball, right? Uh, something as simple as going and making a pass fake. I'm looking at somebody and I'm now blinded to my next step. So when vision is removed, now like the, the proprioception, let's say at the ankle, there's these sensors. We got like these mechanoresensors inside the joint that's constantly sending information to my brain and my brain is sending information back on what to do to adjust. And so based on the speed of motion, based on how far that foot is away from the floor, based on its positioning, and then once it hits the ground, it's telling the brain how much force is going on, uh, is going through the joint. Hey, turn on this muscle because I don't have enough stability here. Like these are conversations that's going on back and forth between these like mechanoreceptors in the ankle and the brain. And so, and it's happening in milliseconds. Obviously this stuff is not consciously controlled. Um, but a, a lot of times we don't have that fully developed. And so that information going to the brain is uh, diluted or it's going slower. Um, a lot of basketball players have previous sprained ankles. And when you sprain an ankle, you're not just damaging the muscle and the ligament and the tendon. You can damage these mechanoreceptors. Sometimes you're pain-free and you come back to sports, um, but the mechanoreceptors are not fully healed. And now the proprioceptive feedback that the brain is getting is now altered. And so you can see how that could cause either another ankle injury or other injuries. Um, because if, that, if, if you're going to strike and it's not in a good position, you could see how... Um, we could get an injury from that. And so uh, having the ability to really heal those mechanoreceptors after these sprained ankles, even these small sprained ankles, is so important. And we'll talk about this more in depth in the future. Um, but a, a few things that you can do is, you know, uh, sensory reweighing theory is like, if I remove one of my senses, another one has to kick up. And so if I close my eyes, I'm taking away the visual system and now proprioception and the skin and proprioception and the joint will have to be elevated to move safely. And so standing on one leg with eyes closed, we do a lot of this in the dur durability code, head turning, head twisting to the side, but even like, um, you know, slow movements, like close your eyes and walk a little bit, take little steps, and then add a little aerial phase where it's now like a baby bound. I can go side to side. Eventually when I get good at that, I can start challenging my movements with the eyes closed. And so this is kind of kicking up your your senses. Um, it's, it's actually funny, I had a group of elite uh, high school players doing these drills. And uh, this summer they go, it's so weird when we do these drills uh, one of the kids said he knows where I am at all times. So like he hears my footsteps. I'll, I'll be like 20 feet away and he hears my footsteps on the turf because one sense is removed and other senses are elevated. They're, they're heightened. It's a protective mechanism. Like babies and dogs can't talk and so they feel energies better. When, when one is taken away, another sense is improved. And so that's kind of what we're doing is, is we're overloading the proprioception like at the joint level and challenging the vestibular system uh, by removing the vision. So that's a great thing to do. Uh, another thing in this review by Han um, 2015 is they talked about there's a link between uh, poor uh, proprioception and poor uh, co-contraction in the ankles upon landing from a jump, which is gonna spike the ground reaction forces to a higher level. So when we talk about like the right muscle kicking on at the right time with that pre-activation, so important for injury reduction and for performance enhancement. But if those mechanoreceptors in the ankle are, if, 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 if that's poor, then you're not gonna fire the right muscle at the right time. Um, and so now we're at a significantly increased risk of injury. Um, so even like we talk about 
plyometrics, but like challenging the skill side of plyometrics by, let's say a freestyle where you put out a bumper plate and then a six inch box and then a 12 inch box and then another, you know, let's say 18 inch box. So you have all these different heights and I can organize them any which way. And then I can go in the middle and I could freestyle. And let's say I'm going off one leg. You'd need a good athlete to be able to get on that 18 inch box from one leg, but I'm going on the plate and then I'm going on the 18 inch box and I'm down, I'm on the 12 inch box, six inch, and I'm just freestyling. And what that's doing is every rep I'm dropping from a different height. And so, uh, my proprioception has to be increased, right? My, my, my proprioception is challenged because I'm dropping from these different heights. So knowing where you are in space, I'm moving this fast. The ground is this far away. I need to kick on these muscles at this time to then brace and brace the joint and prepare for impact. And so stuff like that, um, it, it can go a long way, right? Proprioception. I don't want you guys to think of proprioception is like standing on a BOSU ball. Like that's one component. That's one way to train it. There's so many different ways to train it. And just being an athlete and just challenging yourself with different uh, plyometric contacts, different agility drills, this all improves your proprioceptive ability. And then this is also why playing multiple sports early on matters because you're building this general skill of proprioception. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's probably enough on that topic for now. I'm going to get into that more in the future. Next one, I'm going to react to part of this video um, on red light therapy. There's so many studies on the benefits of red light therapy, and I recently started doing it, so I want to start talking about it a little bit more in my experience with it. So let's so the tune in. Journal of Athletic Training took a look at two groups of individuals. Okay, so. 10 female volunteers that were exposed to red light therapy and 10 female volunteers that were exposed to a placebo. Now, for 14 days, they had them utilize red light therapy for 30 minutes in the red light group, and of course, the other group received placebo. They wanted to measure a few things. They wanted to measure their overall quality of sleep based on a questionnaire, but then they wanted to also measure their overall melatonin serum levels, and then they wanted to measure their performance in a 12-minute run, see how it affected their performance the next day. Well, here's what's interesting. The red light therapy group after 14 days showed significant improvement compared to the placebo group on all counts. But the one that's truly measurable, which is the melatonin levels, was where we really saw something interesting. The red light group had an increase of 38 picograms per milliliter of melatonin versus the other group, 21. So almost double the amount of melatonin being produced in the red light group compared to the other simply proving that from a hormonal side and a neurotransmitter side, we were getting a positive result on sleep simply by utilizing red light therapy for just. So that's benefit number one that the studies are consistently showing is um, better sleep. Um, hasn't, I, I haven't noticed a difference in my experience, but that's because I always sleep really well. Now I know a lot of you guys don't have access to the red light or what, you get red light from the sun right? It's just the difference is you're getting all these other um, lights from the sun and you're getting UV rays. And so, and in the winter, not, people can't always get a lot of sun. Um, so for me, this is like a winter thing. I spend so much time in the sun that I don't think I would really need red light therapy, but basically with red light, you're isolating um, that form of light. If you go out in the morning, early in the morning or in the evening, and you know, when like you see a sunset and it's like reddish orangish, that's that red light coming from the sun. Um, and so you're basically just isolating that component. And there's just so many studies showing the benefits. And I've always been interested in recovery and sleep and all this stuff. And um, so I finally started doing it myself. Again, I didn't notice better sleep, but I always sleep pretty well. Um, but the one thing that I will say that's a takeaway is there's also good research on improving sleep quality by getting out and getting, uh, seeing the sun as soon as you wake up. So if you're not going to do red light at the very least do this, as soon as you wake up, you got to get out in the sun. If you're going to have morning coffee, do it in the sun, whatever you're doing, you got to get out and see the sun because, um, this is going to start to regulate your circadian rhythm and it kind of sets your hormones the right way um, so that when it's nighttime and that sun goes down, it's time to go to sleep. Um, the melatonin is going to uh, be kicked up. Um, 
And so at the very least, get out, even if it's 15 minutes of sun in the morning, even if it's a little bit cloudy, that's fine. That's better than nothing. Get out, see the sun. Um, so since it's winter, I've been doing more red light early in the morning. Let's see some of the other studies that he's breaking down. I chose this video because he did a good job of simplifying some of this information. So I'll use it before so I So he's out. doing, right here, you're doing local red light therapy. So you have a small little red light and you're shining it directly on a certain area. And so there's benefits from a joint standpoint. There's studies on like um, increasing the... Uh, uh, the collagen synthesis. So when it comes to tendons, that's what it's all about, that that rate of collagen synthesis. So like if you had patella tendinopathy, there's some research that would suggest, hey, put that red light directly on that area and we might kick that up. There's also more of the global benefits and this is what I mainly use it for. So if I'm just getting full body exposure to that red light, um, I'm basically affecting my uh, mitochondria and so i'm going to release more atp and with more atp we have more energy throughout the day but not just that i need energy for adaptation so if i'm trying to recover from my muscles or my tendon anything every process that goes on in the body it needs atp so if we're running low on atp you could see how that global issue uh, could cause a local issue or pain or decreased recovery um, so there are benefits at the global level and then also shining on a injured area or something um, that is also backed so by research. Home. So I know it's a huge improvement in my overall mental capacity, but overall, I just feel like I have more energy. So I that's, wanted to make that's, sure that's that it for me. That's energy, energy, energy. Doesn't have to go and I feel better energy. It's like better than coffee and it's more sustained because this is real. This is really actually changing my ATP throughout the day. So that's the main thing that I've noticed. With subscribe it. to some expensive membership at a gym or something like that. You can get your own device by checking them out down in the description. So look at 40 people divided into two groups once again. Okay. We'll look now, at one more study here. Both of these groups, they had perform uh, quadriceps exercises. They wanted to push their muscles to fatigue. And then they exposed one group to red light therapy isolated to the quadricep and another group just to placebo. Well, they wanted to measure a few things. They wanted to measure maximum voluntary contraction strength. Then they also wanted to measure overall creatine kinase levels. And then they also wanted to measure delayed onset muscle soreness. How much did it actually help with recovery? Well, they found that just utilizing the red light therapy alone improved all markers. Now they measured at multiple times. So they exposed to red light therapy and then they measured levels at one minute, at one hour, at 24 hours, at 48 hours, at 72 hours and 96 hours. And they found again, the red light therapy group showed improvement throughout the entire continuum, throughout every single allotted testing period. So a little bit of red light therapy right after a workout boosted recovery, reduced muscle soreness, reduced creatine kinase levels, and ultimately made it so the muscle could contract tighter. Again, this all has to do with the mitochondria. It has to do with the mitochondria pumping out more ATP, but also a decrease in tumor necrosis factor alpha that made it so that the body was able to recover. So imagine more energy, with more recovery, all happening sort of from one epicenter. This is really important stuff. Okay, now lastly, we factor in the brain boosting effect. Yeah, so let me know below if you guys want me to use red light therapy as a main topic so I can dive deeper and break down some of the studies. Uh, but I'm always a little weary when I hear big claims like this. Um, but when I really went deep into the research, I realized that the claims are backed by science. Um, and with my experience, just using it myself, I think it's a no brainer through the winter without a doubt. And then even throughout the summer for, especially for like athletes or CEOs who need more energy or basically every human needs more energy and better sleep and better recovery. So I think that, uh, it is PJF approved, but let me know if you want me to dive deeper into this. The last video for squid reacts for the day is this. I actually haven't seen this one yet, uh, but Gilbert Arenas looking good at age 40. Let's check it out. <laughs> I saw Gilbert Arenas at a gym a couple months ago. And well, not a couple months ago, probably a year ago. And um, he was like going to shoot on the court, but I had a session on the court. So I had the, the court rented out, but he was like gonna come on and he saw that I was about to start a session. He's like, oh, you're about to start a session. My bad, I'll, I'll go. And I was like, no. 
your Gilbert Arenas, you stay. I Like the basketball gods would punish me for life if I kick Gilbert Arenas off the court. This is a bucket right here. This is a walking bucket right here. So I was like, no, 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 stay. Like we'll work around you. I don't care that I paid for the court for this out. We'll work around you. Uh, we would be We would be blessed to share the court with Gilbert Arenas. And he ended up not. He ended up like, he, he felt bad that I had the court and he wanted to shoot. But yeah, I, I, for like a week, I felt like the basketball gods are going to punish me for not convincing him to stay on the court. Yeah, so he's got, he's that, that mid-range game is crazy. That's the one thing, shoot, in your 40s, your 50s, you'll, you'll always have that. If you had that as a player, you'll always keep that. And in fact, it'll get better because you're going to get slower. And so now, like, when you go to drive by somebody, they cut you off every time. So, like, guys in their 40s, I don't want to say old, but it's old for, for basketball age. Guys in their 40s, what used to be a blow by is now a cutoff. And so they always spin back. But then their, their spin isn't that explosive. So now their spins don't get you to the basket. So now it's like cut off turn back to basket and now i'm into like a kobe like let me shim, shimmy let me fade so guys usually get better at that as they age and he definitely got that <laughs> yeah he's, he's skilled he's still just very very skilled old man game oh One leg fade. Yeah, he's talented. <laughs> yeah, he's very skilled. All right, guys, send me videos to react to. Send me the topics that you want covered. Whatever questions you have, let me know. The podcast is back, baby. It's squid season. Let's get it. Mm -hmm.